Hello and welcome to episode 34 of Crime Story Sunday. In this episode, we're going to a small town called Stoke Poges. We're investigating the murder of a young woman who was found during the Easter weekend of 1987. Yet it took 35 years to bring her killer to justice. This is the case of the lady in the lake, Shaney Warren. It was the Easter weekend of 1987 and 26-year-old Shaney Warren was looking forward to that weekend. Shaney wasn't at work that weekend. She worked as a secretary and she had the entire long weekend off. She spent Thursday evening at a restaurant dining with a good friend called Roger. And then on the Friday morning, she woke up She opened her curtains and she thought, maybe I should mow the lawns, the front and back. Only small lawns, but still, they were looking pretty shabby. And she took a ride in her black Vauxhall Cavalier to her parents' house to borrow an extension lead because her lawnmower cable wouldn't stretch all the way. So she said goodbye to her dad and she said, I'll see you Sunday because there were plans for Easter Sunday. Shaney's parents were quite wealthy and they had a number of properties. In fact, they'd bought Shaney's house for her, but they had a, an apartment in um, a seaside town close by and Shaney's mother had already gone there to prepare. The whole family were going to meet round there on Sunday for dinner and just to enjoy each other's company. Unfortunately, Shaney would never make it because there was a monster on the prowl that day. Shaney's case was featured on the UK programme Crime Watch, very popular programme that Jill Dando actually used to present before her murder. We did Jill Dando's case in the last episode, episode 33, go and check it out. That programme excelled at reconstructions, so I'm going to play some of that reconstruction as I talk here. Good evening. As I speak, three incident rooms around the country are standing by to receive your calls. In Maidenhead, they hope you've seen something that will lead them to the killer of Shaney Warren. Shaney was up early on Good Friday and drove to Gerard's Cross to her parents' home. She'd arranged to pick up an extension lead for her electric lawnmower. Shaney was 26, the youngest of three children. Her father, Joe, works from home. Her mother had gone that Easter weekend to the family flat in Bournemouth, where Joe and Shaney were due to join her on Sunday lunchtime. Here's the uh, here's the lead. I've got a plug on it for you. Oh, and, uh, thank you, Dad. That should be long enough for what you want. Right, thank you. Just as she left, she wondered who should do the driving when they went down to Bournemouth on Sunday to join her mother. Her father agreed he'd pick Shaney up from home. Oh, okay. Okay, Dad. Mm. See you Sunday. Okay, sweet. Mm. Take care. Uh, try carefully. I will. See you Sunday. Shaney lived just 10 minutes from her parents at Stoke Poges near Slough. It took her till early afternoon to mow both the back lawn and the front. She planned to take the clippings to the compost heap at her parents' home. Shaney shared her house with two lodgers, Katie and Fiona. All three girls potted round that afternoon and Shaney seemed to have no firm plans for the evening. Around 6pm, one of Shaney's housemates saw her leaving. She'd bagged up all the grass clippings that she'd got from the lawn and she was going to drop them round to her dad's place before going to visit Roger, her friend. She'd bought an Easter egg for him and a bottle of champagne as a thanks for buying her dinner. So her housemate saw her leave just after six and then around 6.50, about five miles away in Taplow, somebody reported seeing a black car 
struggling to kind of manoeuvre into a lay-by, seemed to be stuttering and just having problems. That vehicle did make it into a lay-by at the side of a busy road, the A4. A truck driver saw that vehicle parked with the door slightly ajar and he thought it was strange. However, he didn't go and investigate. The following morning, he went back to his truck and the car was still there. It struck me as being odd that someone would leave an A-registered car with the door obviously not locked, but I assumed that it had broken down and that whoever owned it had gone for a recovery vehicle of some sort. But other than that, I didn't pay any great attention to it. But it wasn't until that afternoon that the alarm was truly raised. A woman walking her dog down the side of Taplow Lake had the shock of her life. Her German shepherd waded into the water, which was only about 18 inches deep, and started to become agitated. And when she looked carefully, she saw a body. The lake where her body was found was just a short walk from that lay-by. Upon investigations, police found only one set of footprints leading around that vehicle, and they were from a stiletto-heeled shoe. It was the mid-1980s, stiletto heels were in high fashion here in the UK. Shaney liked to wear them, and they could see the points that the stiletto shoes had made in the ground. If you've ever worn stiletto shoes, you'll know how easy it is to make an imprint with those heels whereas other shoes might have virtually no footprint there. When Shaney was found, the driver's seat of the vehicle had been fully reclined. The bags of grass clippings were in the front and scattered around, whereas Shaney had put them in the boot. And the Easter egg was there on the floor of the vehicle. And they found various other items belonging to Shaney, either in the car or near the car. Shaney herself had been found face down with her hands tied behind her back with a red jump lead from her car and her ankles had been bound with a yellow rope. There was a scarf round her mouth and a ligature had been placed round her neck. The medical examiner determined that her cause of death was drowning. The manner of death became controversial. Thames Valley Police, who were investigating the case, were sure that this was murder and they actually began a murder investigation. However, the Home Office pathologist, Dr Benjamin Davis, disagreed. He said he'd seen three similar cases recently and was convinced she had tried to strangle herself before tying herself up and tumbling into the water to commit suicide. Well, from the beginning, I thought this was a suicide. Uh, I, the young lady's uh, wrist, tying up of the wrists and ankles was so uh, amateurish that I can't imagine any assailant attempting to tie her up in that particular way. And it obviously could have been done by Miss Warren herself. And so I suggested this to the police and suggested they called in uh, the most notable expert in this field in Britain, which they did. And he agreed with me. Even though there was some bruising, there was no signs of a struggle. And apparently, according to him, she hadn't been sexually assaulted. So the coroner called an inquest. And at Shaney's inquest, Geoffrey Budworth, who was a knots expert, demonstrated how she could have actually tied herself up in that way. But even he admitted it would have been, in his words, a bit of a business, very complex way of committing suicide. The ligature, according to Benjamin Davis, she might have put that round her neck in an attempt to strangle herself. But when she couldn't go through with that, she decided to tie herself up with the jump leads and a rope from her own car and then throw herself into 18 inches of water. Shaney was terrified of water. There was no way she would do that if she wanted to end her own life. And there was absolutely no evidence 
of depression, of any form of mental illness. She was happy. She had friends. She had a nice job. She had a lovely family. She was going to spend the Sunday with them. There was absolutely no indication, neither in Shaney's life or in her writing. She used to keep a diary like a journal. Nothing would indicate that she was suicidal. A psychiatrist who spoke at the inquest was also convinced that she wasn't suicidal. Consultant psychiatrist Dr John Hamilton, who studied her diaries after her death, said there was no hint of psychiatric illness and he couldn't find any reason at all to suggest she would have committed suicide in such a bizarre and extraordinary way. But yet, Dr Benjamin Davis, who, according to people who knew him, could be extremely smug and somewhat conceited, liked the attention from the media. And he couldn't imagine that any offender, any murderer, would have done something like that in such an amateurish fashion. Okay, so murderers have to be not experts now, do they? Very strange. Very strange indeed. How could she have done it? She was gagged with a scarf. I mean, I just can't imagine how you could tie yourself up. The knots were really tight, so you'd have to, like, tighten the knots with your teeth with a gag in your mouth. Now, her heartbroken parents and uh, she had two older siblings were shocked at the suggestion that their daughter and sister took her own life. They said, no way, this was a murder. The coroner determined an open verdict. The coroner couldn't decide either. But in all credit and fairness to Thames Valley Police, they never stopped believing that this was a murder. So we now have to fast forward over 30 years to find out the results of that investigation. Enter Donald Robinson. Among his previous victims were a 14-year-old girl a 17-year-old girl walking home after missing her last train. He'd actually been jailed in 1978 for burglary and the attempted rape of a 15-year-old girl. He was released in April 1981, so just three years later. Three months after that, he raped a 16-year-old. She was so traumatised that when she was asked to identify him, in an identity parade. She tearfully told police that she believed it was the man standing in Robertson's position. But at the time, the police decided that that wasn't enough evidence to justify charging Robertson for this crime. Four days later, he raped a 14-year-old girl who'd been riding her bike. During that particular attack, he shook a broken bottle at the girl and told her she would be marked for life if she went to the police. But she did. He pled guilty, and in October 1981, he uh, began a five-year sentence. Just five years. Just four months after his release in December 1986, he then attacked and murdered Shaney Warren, throwing her bound and gagged body into Taplow Lake. Two months later, he struck again, attacking a 17-year-old girl as she walked home along the A4 on the outskirts of Slough, having missed her train. He was convicted for her kidnap and rape in 2010. Those were just some of Donald Robertson's crimes. But it was not until November 2020 that the major crime review team were looking over Shaney's file. It was always open and all files, cold or not, are subject periodically to review here in the UK. And some eagle-eyed investigator was uh, notified that there could be a match between the DNA profile on the mouth gag. Yeah, there was DNA. There was DNA the whole time. The whole time. The whole time there was DNA. Now, to be fair, in 1987, DNA technology being used in forensic cases was very new and not used reliably until the mid-90s. But there was DNA on the mouth gag all along, and it was a match 
for that of Donald Robertson. He was arrested in June 2021 for the murder of Shaney Warren. And this is what the Crown Prosecution Service wrote about the trial. The jury at Reading Crown Court has today found Donald Robertson, 66, guilty of the false imprisonment, indecent assault and murder of Shaney Warren and the kidnap and rape of a 16-year-old girl. Advances in forensic science provided a breakthrough in both cases with new evidence being discovered that clearly linked Robertson to these crimes. When a cold case team at the Thames Valley Police reviewed the unsolved case of Miss Warren, further forensic work found traces of Robertson's DNA on the gag found in Miss Warren's mouth, something that hadn't been swabbed in the initial examination and on her bra. A pathologist who reviewed the new evidence and the previous pathologist's crazy findings, I inserted the word crazy, the Crown Prosecution Service didn't say that, concluded someone else was involved in her death. This compelling forensic evidence played a vital part in the case presented by the Crown Prosecution Service at trial. It was supported in Miss Warren's case by accounts of her life and state of mind at the time of her death and from witnesses who knew her well. The prosecution successfully argued that the positive identification of Robertson made by the other victim after she was raped and was admissible as evidence, just discarded her picking him out of a lineup first time round, Robertson's previous convictions for sexual offences, which spanned more than three decades, were also presented as evidence of his tendency to commit crimes of this nature, and that the DNA findings were unlikely to be a coincidence. Robbie Weber of the Crown Prosecution Service said, Donald Robertson is a dangerous and deadly predatory sex offender who attacked women for over three decades using violent threats to get what he wanted. In the case of Shaney Warren, he went as far as to take her life. You know, these um, serial offenders, they need to be more and more violent to get their kicks and sometimes that results in them committing murder. And then the Crown Prosecution Service ended with, our thoughts are with Miss Warren's loved ones and the other victim in this case who have waited many years to see justice served. Donald Robertson aged 66, was found guilty of the following offences at Reading Crown Court on the 17th of May 2022. One count of kidnapping and one count of rape, 1981. One count of false imprisonment, one count of indecent assault and one count of murder, 1987. He's due to be sentenced on the 19th of May 2022 at the same court. Shaney's brother paid tribute to her as his warm and caring sister, as he described how a loss left a gaping hole in the family. Stephen Warren said Shaney's parents had died last year with her murder never resolved in their minds. No sentence would be harsh enough for the psychopath and coward who killed her. From the day Shaney was born, our family dynamic changed not just with the usual baby things and the subsequent arrival of dolls, dresses and so on, but over time our new little addition grew into a wonderfully pretty and happy child whom everybody immediately took to their hearts. On Good Friday 1987, after mowing the lawn, another duty she resolutely took on. She popped out to dispose of the grass cuttings, get some food and buy a card and Easter egg for a friend and ex-boyfriend. She was due back, lightly, within an hour or so. But it's one of life's tragedies that everything can be destroyed in an instant. Somehow or other, Shaney encountered the serial rapist Donald Robertson, whose practice was to attack unaccompanied young girls and women, terrifying them into submission with vicious threats and abuse. We cannot imagine what the last moments of Shaney's life must have been like. But you may agree that no punishment is enough for her attacker, a psychopath and a coward who lacked the courage to attend court 
or even give evidence via a video link. As you can imagine, the loss of Shaney left a gaping hole in the family, not just of a central member and surely its brightest light, but of a force of energy, hope and positivity. Her parents never recovered and for us all, nothing felt the same again. Absolutely heartbreaking. At sentencing, Donald Robertson was given a 30-year minimum life sentence. You know, he's going to be 96 by the time he's eligible to apply for parole. I don't think Robertson is going to see freedom again. Thankfully, good riddance. What a psycho. Okay, guys, let me know what you think about this case. Have you heard about the case of Shaney Warren? Have you heard of Donald Robertson? Let me know in the comments and I'll see you in the next episode of Crime Story Sunday. Bye, folks. Tilly. 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 What's this? Good. Good boy.